Thank you for coming on a Saturday evening. I understand that to have an audience as filled as this one is on a Saturday night in Milano is very unusual. So I say, thank you. <laughs> Bravo to you. Okay. So this is my 50th year. 50 years of making photographs. And the question that keeps coming up for me is why does it still stay so interesting to me? You would think over 50 years that it would become flat. But it's not been the case. It seems to me every six or seven years, something has turned over in me, like a season, changing my ideas about photography and the subjects that interest me. So basically, for 50 years, this medium, this mystery, the daily world, that is visible for all of us has provided me with a continuous mystery that's kept me connected to photography and to myself. So in that sense, photography has been my teacher, my master. And at this age, after 50 years of work, I feel refreshed and ready to begin a new body of work. And every day that I wake up and go out into a city street or the countryside or a small town here in Italy, I feel as if a hunger still burns inside of me. Something that says, keep looking. What's that? Why is this so interesting? Look at that face. Look at the gesture someone makes. Look at the way the light rolls across the land. It seems that all day long I say, look at this. Vedi, look at that. The world has a, a stimulating effect on me. And so I think in some small way, I honor that by raising the camera and pressing the button and taking in yet another thing that I see that is moving or rich with mystery or makes me feel love for something. These human sensations orchestrated through a camera, through a machine, have been the kind of exchange that has given my life some meaning. So I think today, in the world we live in, in which every single person with a telephone has a camera, we are in a richer environment Every one of us can take a photograph of something and identify with it. And it wasn't always this way. You had to make a serious choice to buy a camera, to go out and make photographs. And now it's available for everyone. Now, I know that's too much for you to count. But <laughs> did it, did does anyone need a translation of that? Okay. 
Okay. That's okay. <laughs> go ahead. So, you can stay or you can go back to your seat. But I, I, it's, it's all right. You keep me company. Yes. <laughs> when I began 50 years ago, photography was not the rich um, art world that it is today. It was thought of as something small down there, artigiani. Not a full-fledged, a full-blown art form. I remember in 1964 seeing an exhibition in New York City of Ansel Adams photographs. The price for one of his photographs at that time was $25. In terms of euros right now, that would be 20 euros for an Ansel Adams photograph. My generation of photographers had no hope to survive. We knew that we could not make a living with photography. So we made photographs out of the passion of believing that this medium could communicate our interior sensations, our gut feeling, our ideas. And there were a small group of us in New York, Gary Winogrand, myself, Deanne Arbus, Todd Papa George, Ralph Gibson, Lee Friedlander, who would see each other on the streets and, and share our passion for this medium. Because that's all there was, was a communication between um, younger photographers and slightly older photographers. But it was enough to give us the necessary energy to continue doing the work. So I'd like to show you some early photographs from uh, a retrospective book that was published this year by Feiden in London called Taking My Time, which is Prendendo Il Mio Tempo. And I, I came to that title because I realized that over the cycle of 50 years, I never rushed to do anything. I was quick on the street, very fast, making photographs, but slow in developing the ideas that were in there, or maybe slow in recognizing the ideas inside the photograph. And so I'd like to show you uh, some of the cycles that I went through over these 50 years. And I offer you an opportunity here. This is our only time to be together. If a question comes up, something you need to ask me, just call out and say, Joel, so we can have a conversation instead of just a lecture. Agreed? Any questions right now? Okay, let's begin. Okay, in 1962, I was an art director at a small advertising agency and I designed a booklet, a, uh, a booklet. And my boss hired Robert Frank to make the photographs for my booklet. And as I watched Robert Frank work, and I, I knew nothing about Robert Frank, as I watched him work, I had a vision that the world was moving and that you could intercept the movement of the world with a camera. 
And I did not know that before. And it so excited me that I immediately went back to my office and quit my job and went out on the street with a borrowed camera and I put color film in the camera because I knew that I could process the film and get it back three hours later. And I was so hungry to see images that I began with color, not knowing that people thought that color was for amateurs or commercials or wedding photographs. But I used it as my primary material. Within two months of picking up a camera, I hitchhiked, auto stop, auto stop New York to Mexico City. And on the way in Mexico, I made this photograph. And it surprised me that you could take a photograph, an entire frame, and you could have just a small, incident in one corner of the picture and still the picture had energy in it. I was beginning to learn that you could see all over the frame. I was out on the streets of New York every day and of, of course I, I, as a 24 year old young man I was timido. And, and shy, but I had to learn to be more, um, not aggressive, but just more outgoing. And I, I made a series of pictures of portraits of women, often powerful women or uh, tough women. I think because my mother was a very strong female presence in my life. It, women attracted me. I wanted to know more about the mystery of women. In New York City, during the springtime, there are parades every weekend. And the English photographer, Tony Ray Jones, I don't know if you know this name, he and I were about the same age and we found each other. And every Saturday, we would go to the parades and we would work around the edges of the parade because the parade gave us cover, sort of camouflage, so that we could observe things going on and learn how to get close to them without necessarily photographing the pageantry of the parade. Sometime in that first year, at the end of 1962, I began to realize that when I projected slides on a screen, Nobody ever got up to look closely at them. They became an entertainment. And so I, I wanted something more intimate. I wanted to be able to read my pictures one after the other. And I realized that I could make black and white prints and have a different experience. So I added black and white to my vocabulary. I took a trip 150 kilometers north of New York into a resort area called the Catskill Mountains. I actually went with Dan Arbus for the day. 
And I made this photograph. A man behind a fence. There's nothing much going on there. Yet I felt it in my gut. I felt that instinct of this is, this is surreal, bizarre, strano. And, and I made this photograph and I showed it to the director of the Museum of Modern Art. And he took the picture and put it in his first exhibition. He was the new director of the museum. John Sharkovsky was his name. And he put this in the exhibition and he hung it next to a photograph by Robert Frank. I thought, my God, in, in, in a year, I was able to make a photograph and get it into a museum. And, wow, how amazing, photography. <laughs> but that picture taught me something that ambiguity, the difficulty of actually understanding what's there, is an important resource for photography, an important energy for photography, and that I should pay attention to that. This has no ambiguity in it. You see, in the beginning, when you don't know the medium, small things, a gesture, the dance of life, the sense of futility that this man would be kicking a piece of paper <laughs> in that place on New Year's Eve in Times Square, New York. Somehow that gesture and the futility for me became the human spirit that I was trying to photograph. You never know with photographs, what is really going on. That's part of the beauty and the mystery of this medium. The camera describes just what it is that you point it at. It describes it precisely, and yet we're never quite sure. Is this a threat? Is this a gesture of, you know, kindness. We don't know. By a year later, I started to have the feeling, and it took me a while to grow out of it, that the task of the photographer, the job of the photographer, is not to put the subject in the center of the frame. There's a possibility of spreading the subject out all over the frame. And although it took me many years to uh, arrive at a working method that did that, I got the first vision, the first taste of it by 1963-64. That there was more than shooting the arrow into the center of the picture. Although sometimes you have no choice. <laughs> In 
1964, I, I, like so many of my generation, I went out around America in search of Robert Frank, who had done his great work, The Americans, which to my generation, I don't know how all of you see that book here, but to my generation, The Americans was the, the highest level, the highest literary level of photography, that he could take all of these separate photographs and bring them together into a book with such power and such truth that it became a dream for me. I wanted to be able to do that too. And so in a kind of youthful innocence, I packed up an old Volkswagen bus and I drove around America for three months photographing. And I remember here in Los Angeles, California, seeing this woman and her child. And she's sitting in the classic American situation, a nice house on the corner. She has everything, the car in the garage, the child, and yet she looks absolutely bored out of her mind. And I thought that seems to sum up the America that I was experiencing. You know, for me, I never question when I make a photograph. It, to me, is the most intuitive and purest of moments. I walked into this room, the curtain was blowing. I just felt, this is so innocent, almost nothing here. And yet, there was a lyrical quality to it that said, Make this photograph. I don't know, it it's, seems, <laughs> seems very funny to me, this picture. My discipline means I carry a camera with me, a Leica camera, which I've been carrying since almost the very beginning, everywhere I go, every day. Because you never know what's going to come up for you. Sitting in someone's house after dinner and they say, I want to show you my slides. And that's what happens. That little, th that, oh, sorry. That this theater and this mirror and this screen and this archway, somehow all of it comes together out of nothing. To me, that's the good fortune of being a photographer and carrying a camera. You want to translate something? Oh, yeah. I want to. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You can eat me. If I get to something difficult. Okay. But nobody's leaving yet. No. <laughs> thank, you for, thank you all for being so willing to listen to this in English. And I'm, again, I apologize for not being capable of addressing you in your beautiful musical language. I'm trying to learn it. Perhaps this photograph has been instructive to me in a really profound way. 
about the luck of being out in the world with a camera so that when something as unexpected as this happens, and I'm sure there was no relation between this man with the hammer and this fallen man, except that he was in the way of this guy who, who had to go back to work someplace. But what really puzzles me is the greater tragedy of all of these people standing around and not doing anything, not offering their help. It's one of the tragedies of big city life. In 1966, I made some money in advertising in New York, and I came here to Europe for a year. And I just lived and photographed everywhere in Europe. But I did spend more than, let's say, six months in Spain living with some flamenco gypsies. So I had a kind of interior look at Spain. And from that point on, I thought that would be my, my, uh, the country that I would go to repeatedly in Europe. But it turns out that Italy is the place that makes me feel myself most strongly. Before I said ambiguity was an, uh, a central issue for me, and I think this photograph offers that as an observation. There's nothing going on in this picture. Nothing. There's no connection, really. A man, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I have to go backwards. There's really nothing, this man walks by, this kid is playing on the ground, this man is looking. Nobody is connected. And yet the picture has, for me, one of those telling moments where I think, this is what photography can be. This is how its mystery is illuminated. A fraction of a second, 250th of a second, and a photograph comes into being. You know, sometimes the observation is just a small observation, like these things and these things, that in an, in an instant you see that at some kind of subconscious level, and you risk making a photograph that contains it. It's not about it. It just contains it. You know that expression of life imitates art? I mean, this is a museum in Paris. I walked in and, and th that was going on, inside and outside, the real and the imagined. And without a camera, it doesn't exist. You know, I, th I think of it as photography. 
as the game of sight. I'm sorry, were you raising your hand? Please. Did you hear his question? Okay, so he's saying, did you go around with two cameras and was there a reason for black and white or color? Yes, I did have two Leicas, one with color and one with black and white. And when I could make two pictures side by side, if the action didn't change too quickly and I had a moment to do it, I did. Because I wanted to know why color. Remember, in the 60s and 70s, black and white was the f art form of photography. Color was considered to be nothing serious. But I didn't feel that way. I felt that color had a real voice and a real reason, and I wanted to make photographs that I could present an argument for color photography with. And so I, I carried these two cameras. In fact, in the exhibition, there's one or two pairs of these uh, black and white in color together. Sometimes it is the smallest detail in the overall photograph that is the key that goes into the artist and opens the moment up. For me, the way that little boy brings his knees together so that he could hold steady when he pours the water on the half man's hands, a thin stream of water, it seemed to me to be a gesture of dignity and respect. And it was the, the, the heart of the picture for me. It was the reason I leaped into the street to make the photograph. You have to trust your instinct because your instinct is who you are as an artist. If you follow your instinct every single time you're out and don't question it, you will make a, a, a series of photographs that will only be your photographs. They won't look like things you see on the net. They won't be images you see on any resource or catalog or other book. They'll only be your photographs. They will look like your inner thoughts and your strongest qualities. And it's a very difficult thing to follow because so many photographs out there are seductive. The color, the sunset, the the shiny bodies, all of the things that are drawing you towards a kind of cliché, when in fact every single one of you is capable of making a work of art, a photographic work of art if you so choose. But you have to trust the inner line, the interior During that year in Europe, I drove all over Europe and in the car I carried the Leica on my lap. And when I saw something whoosh, at a hundred kilometers an hour, whoosh, I just raised the camera and made the photograph. 
Because if I stopped the car and tried to make the picture, it would be gone. And when I got back to New York, I had 2,000 photographs made from a moving car. And I had an exhibition in the Museum of Modern Art. I was just 30 years old. But the secret was that being inside the car was like being in inside a camera. There was a window. Out the window was a picture that kept on moving past me. And every time something was strong in the window, in the picture, I raised the camera like that. And it, it allowed me to break all the rules that one begins to assemble for oneself. I let time and the randomness of the frame create the image for me. And surprises happen. Castles and dragons. <laughs> Sometimes there are tender moments. I, I to this day. I remember them coming by the car and I could hear her scarf like that. And every time I look at this photograph, I hear her scarf flapping and I see, I see this, I don't know, I just see this ancient face just moving by. No way to explain it. If you, <laughs> if you don't have a camera, you don't see it. So in, in this picture for me is a lesson. Of course, you can't see the whole lesson, but right here, this guy, this photographer, had a piece of tissue paper on the back of his camera. And on the tissue paper was a drawing of where the two models should stand. And he sort of filled in the picture. And I'm standing and watching him organize the two models to fit in the picture upside down, turned over. And at the very same moment, this kid flies off the bridge. And I thought, there it is. That's the range of photography from the manipulated commercial photography to the instantaneous, uh, unexpected work of photography. Does it remind you of home at all when you were a kid? <laughs> in 1971, America was still in the Vietnam War, and I received a Guggenheim Fellowship to make a work around America about the state of the country. And I chose as my subject the way people spent their leisure time, their free time. Because America at that point was a very rich country and people were beginning to 
have retirement communities, and, and they weren't paying attention. The young people were, but the, the rest of the country wasn't paying attention to the war in Vietnam. And for me, it was the beginning of the decline of America to where it is today. And this picture gave me a sense of the broken down quality of America, that this man was looking at his broken down car. So the rest, there's another eight or 10 pictures here from that series called Still Going. Again, these last few are made from a car. I mean, it's, it's something I continue to do even here because it's a good exercise. It's a, like a mind refresher every day to, to stay connected even when doing a task like driving to the supermarket. So around this time, by 1975 or six, I started to, uh, I, I, I had stopped black and white completely. No more black and white. Except this has black and white in it, but no more black and white. And um, I began to feel that I had reached one of those plateaus that I talked about earlier, and that I wanted to see if I could give up this kind of incident, you know. It's, it's, um, it was like being an athlete and making a good kick. I wanted to see if I could get beyond this kind of picture to something and this kind of picture. And this kind of picture. where incidents, those moments that happen, are the story. I wanted to see if I could break away from that and begin to add the depth of a space in a city to incidents in the front until I could separate them and make a photograph about everything in the frame. That early recognition I had 10 years before. I wanted to see if I could make pictures where there was nothing in the center of the frame holding it together. If the energy throughout the image was enough to make it interesting to read as a photograph. A question. It's only a question. I'm not even sure that I was successful. But that doesn't matter. What matters is a question comes up that you feel you must break away from everything you know and try to do something that is out of your comfort zone. During this period when I was making these photographs, my two closest friends, Gary Winogrand and Todd Papageorge were looking at these pictures and saying to me, basically, you've lost your touch. You're out of, you're out of the game in some way. But I didn't think so. I thought I was 
trying for something that was going to be a, a different level of language for me. I was trying to push the level of language of photography. Particularly pleased with those little booties on that dog and all their feet. Yeah. It's challenging to try to make a picture, particularly in a city, of the overall space where things are disconnected but somehow there's a dynamic, there's a kind of energy that holds it together, just barely holds it together. Can you see the difference in these kinds of pictures? They don't have the, that joke or that story in the center to hold them together. Chaotic. And at this point in time, I was starting to make big prints. Not as big as this, but big enough that you could enter the print as if it was a window We'll take a moment here. At that very moment, which was 1976, I, I realized that I was having a kind of frustrating moment with 35 millimeter. That if I wanted to make big prints with everything in focus, I needed to have a larger format image that would give me the description of everything in the space. And it shows you how an artist might arrive at this idea. John Tcharkovsky, the director of the Museum of Modern Art, often wrote in his books and exhibitions that all that a camera does is describe things in front of it. And I misunderstood that. I took it in as a way of saying, ah, a camera just describes things. I want more description, greater, deeper description. And so I went to the large format camera and began to make pictures of spaces and light and had a complete revolution in my life and my work. The scale changed. I felt comfortable putting small things far away. Because you know, when you work on the street, you're always in a two or three meter relationship to everybody else. It's very sexy. It's very dynamic. It's hot. It's got energy in it. With a large format camera, you step back in the space and trust that the camera will describe everything in it. And so a change, an internal change about one's energy occurs. You could risk making a picture like this because I know when I look at the negative that every one of these seats, every one of these people is clearly described. You can see their face. You can see the number on the seat, even from this distance.
This is the very first photograph I ever made with a view camera. I went to Cape Cod with my family for the summer and we got to the rented house we had and I set the camera up for the first time to see how it worked. And I struggled for an hour to get it in focus and get the lines straight. And then I made this picture. And it's lived with me since 1976. And I think, wow, I was lucky on that first picture. And then, as photography always does, it showed me yet another side to it. With this large camera, I could look into the darkness as it was coming on, as the day was ending. I could set the camera up and I make an exposure of two minutes or three minutes, whatever was necessary, in order to record these subtle changes in the light. But you know, when you walk around with a, a big camera on, on legs, people people see you. And so people would come over and speak to me. And before that, I thought I was invisible on the streets of New York or Paris or wherever I went. I practiced invisibility and speed. But now I was completely visible and people would come and, and ask me, why are you using this big camera? Why, you know, it's so old. Of course, the camera was made in the same year as I was born, 1938. So I didn't think of it as being old, but. So when people began to speak to me, I found myself looking at them and realizing that people were fascinating, that they were a landscape themselves, their skin, their clothes, their hair, the, the, the whole tradition of portrait photography, August Sander and, and uh, um, you know, Irving Penn and Atjay. And I suddenly had this kind of discovery that these people are interesting to me. I should follow this um, curious new question that's come up. And I made several thousand portraits out in the open air, one image each. Didn't do a shooting as you do in a studio, just one image. There's a great story, but I, I, can't, I, I, I can't explain it. It's, I want to, but I just can't. During the, during the 80s, I had a studio in New York City, and this was the view from my studio windows. And over a 10-year period, I made many photographs of this landscape here against the weather. Because New York is an island on the Atlantic Ocean and it has weather systems that are tropical and arctic. It could be um, blazing hot and, and frigid cold. And I made, for all these years I made these pictures and in 2001, 
I was to have an exhibition at a gallery in Soho called Looking South, New York City Landscapes. And of course, in every picture were the Twin Towers. And uh, a, few, a few days before 9-11, uh, I was in New York preparing for the exhibition and I was back in the studio and I made a photograph, not this one, and it, it wasn't very interesting. The sky was plain, the, it just was not interesting. And I thought, uh, I'll come back next week. They'll always be there. You know the way you say you assume that things will stay the way they are. And then three days later, that. And it teaches you to really appreciate the moment, every moment of your life, because you never know what the next day will bring. As a native New Yorker, I wanted to do something. I didn't want to just make sandwiches for the workers or, you know, wave to them as they went into Ground Zero. I wanted to be effective. I wanted to help. But there was no way to help. And one afternoon, when I was near the perimeter of the World Trade Center, which was covered by fences and canvas tarpaulins, I was standing in a crowd of other street people, and I raised my Leica, and when I did, a police officer, a woman, struck me on my shoulder. And I turned around, and she said, no photographs, buddy. This is a crime scene. Now, as a native New Yorker, you don't have to take crap from cops. I don't know how you feel here about authority especially when it has a plume on its hat. I said to him, what are you talking about? This is the street. The crime scene is in there. I'm a citizen. I can take a picture. And she put her face right in my, she said, I'm taking that camera away from you. Mayor Giuliani says, no photography allowed. I heard that. I wanted to kiss her. Because as soon as I heard no photography allowed, I had this thought. You know the light bulb over the head? <laughs> Boop! I thought, no photography allowed? That means no history. That cannot happen. He cannot take history away. And I immediately thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into ground zero some way and make an archive of photographs that tells the story of all of the work inside. But of course, the city kept on saying no, no. And they pushed me away and pushed me away. And you know what I learned? You can fight back. You can make something happen. And I did. I pushed until I found the little spot that I could go into. And I managed to get inside Ground Zero and stay inside for nine months. And I had a bunch of detectives, New York City detectives, protecting me every day because they didn't believe that the mayor had a right to cancel history. And these guys broke the law. They took it on themselves to say, Screw the mayor. We're going to take care of you. So things like that happen if you push hard enough. Because all of us, when authority pushes at us, it's easy to give up and say, oh, I'm going home. I'm not, I'm not going to have my own revolution. But the fact is, we have a voice whether it's here or in America, we have a voice and we have to speak out about things that mean something to us.
this crappy economy that you're living in. Go get them. Great nations, great nations, industrious, can make anything, and yet hobbled by economic crisis. It just is tragic to see. So for nine months, I worked in Ground Zero, and, and I faced every kind of emotion, seeing the bodies of people who were crushed and burned to ashes, seeing beautiful days, and knowing that I was looking at, at a cemetery with 3,000 people in it, and the day was beautiful. It was a day, it was in fact, almost now, late October, on a beautiful sunny fall day in New York, and I remember standing there thinking, should I take this photograph? It, 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 there are dead people in there. Why do I feel so good right now? The sun was warming my back. I felt the kind of clarity of the day. And I thought, I must. I must take this picture. Because this is what nature and time will do for us. Nature and time push the events, the tragic events, Further and further away, every day, they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And one recognizes that it's a tribute to nature. Thank you for giving us a day to recover, a day to feel good to be alive. Thanks. Down here, this little group of men are detectives from New York, and they're the ones who protected me. For 50 days, every day, they took care of me and kept me in the game. And I'm still in touch with many of them, and all of them are sick. Every single one of them has pulmonary problems from breathing in all of the dust. I'll try to tell you a quick story. Are we okay with time or is it, are we running out of time? We're good? Okay. Like five minutes more is all we have. We are standing in the South Tower. And in here, in the center, was a space where the beams had fallen. And that space was a stairway from the World Trade Center. And in that space, they found five bodies of firemen, intact, dressed, all of their clothes and their tanks and everything intact. And one man came out of that, that space and said to everybody here, the stairway is from the North Tower. We're standing in the South Tower. And every one of these men all together went like this, as if they could see the tower falling and these five men in the stairway flying hundreds of meters to their death. Each of these firemen could picture the loss of their lives. And it was an amazing experience to be with these men when they had this surge of emotion. <clears throat> the 
This feels, always has felt very Italian to me, like the baths of Carcal, something about the, the ruin of this. You know, one of the things that people don't know about Ground Zero is that there were hundreds of trees on the streets around the towers, as well as lampposts and bus stops, all tall things. And when those buildings fell, huge steel Trave came whirling through the streets like blades in a blender. Blender. And it cut down everything bus shelters, trees, lampposts, telephone booths. Everything was just cut down. And people were too. People who were running away were just cut up by all this steel flying through the air. And this humble tree is a reminder to me. At the very same time that I was working in Ground Zero, I had a book commission by a publisher in New York to do a book on Tuscany. And they had given me an advance of $25,000. And I spent the advance in ground zero, doing my work. And at one point, the publisher called me and said, how is my book? <laughs> I said, it's not. I spent the money in ground zero. He said, Joel, you have to go to Tuscany. So when things quieted down, in January of 2002, I snuck off to Tuscany, the Val d'Orsha and the Val d'Arbia, below Siena, and I worked for two or three weeks and then came back every season for the rest of the year. But Tuscany gave me a new perspective because living in ground zero every day, and thinking about terrorism, which has become a reality for all of us, it was easy to forget that in places in the world, old traditions, old rhythms are still at work. And coming to Tuscany and feeling the system there, the, the way the land was cared for, gave me a sense of goodness, that the world was still a good place. And it was important for me to make a book that showed that this was a quality that we all still had in our lives. It was the antidote to the terror and the tragedy and the chaos. I mean, really, to go from this to that. It's sunlight doing the same thing. But instead of trees, I have these things. And every time they pulled, there were 75 of these machines in a space of four New York City blocks. Probably four hectares. 75 of these machines, and every time they pulled one of these pieces of metal out, there would be an explosion, because down below, the fires were raging, burning everything that had fallen, plus all of the airplane fuel that had gone to the bottom. And so oxygen would come in when they pulled out a stick. They called these things stick. Wow. 
By the time they got to the bottom, which was seven stories below ground level to get to bedrock, they were taking this rubble every day and scraping through the rubble looking for a bone or a tooth or a ring or something that would identify the DNA of someone who died there. And it was such an incredibly tender task of these men with rakes, just raking the ground, that when I came back to Tuscany and I saw the ground and I felt this communion with it, I felt this connection to the ground. And in fact, this work, I mean, this is what I call a dumb photograph. It has no art to it. It's just dirt. Okay, it has a little frost on it here, a little brina, la brina. Right? <laughs> Makes it a little nice. Like gelato, fungo gelato. <laughs> but this work, three or four years later produced for me a new body of work called The Elements, Air, Fire, Earth, and Water, in which I only make pictures of just something like this. No horizon line, no space, flat. I don't think I have any here. But, but it shows you one thing begins to show you the doorway to the next. This guy just got out of prison two days before. Sing Sing. And he has a job in Ground Zero. And I became friendly with him. And I said to him, how did you get a job? I just got out of prison. How did you get a job? And this is the way he spoke. I got friends in the family, you know what I mean? They helped me out. He's a mafia guy from Jersey, and they gave him a job. Hey. Like a ballet company. This is a hip bone. They found the bone doing that raking. Finally, in 2002, at the end of May, they had cleaned the site. This is the last day before the closing of the site. And still, some man on his hands and knees was searching for the last piece of a human being that he could help identify. There was a kind of devotion inside Ground Zero that I have never experienced in all of my life. People who spent nine months in there searching for strangers. To me, it felt like it was the best quality of the American idea the sense of the individual who's worth something and that people will go to any length to help, in this case, identify the dead. And I, I just thought, I'm seeing something incredibly basic and good in American human nature, which I don't always feel that way about. And he, this is the last picture. But on the last day when they closed the site, I was walking around. And there was a railroad train underneath Ground Zero 
that went under the Hudson River to carry commuters back and forth from New Jersey to New York. And as I walked, I saw bits of grass growing. And I thought, ah, for 35 years, these seeds were buried in the dark of a tunnel. And now, sunlight and rain and warmth and the grass was beginning to grow again after 35 years of being in the dark. And it gave me some kind of hope that good things might come of this, that the space would be cleaned and that new buildings would rise and a park would be there and monuments to the dead and that life would go on and maybe things would be good again someday. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.